It's seven o'clock. This is Sarah Mellis, chair of the finance committee. I'll call the finance committee meeting to order on Tuesday, June 9th. Uh, June 20th. Very good. That's lost a few days there. Um, I'll take a roll call vote. Mike? Yep. Maury? Yes. Tom? Yes. Dean? Yes. And Sarah? I expect Andy to be joining us shortly. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the OPEP annual report, and we have, hi, Andy. There's a seat over there for you to smoke and see the screen if you like. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the OPEP annual report, and we have Don Sherman, Dan Sherman on Zoom. Um, and yeah. I believe that everyone received a copy of the report. Is that correct? I sent it out. Okay. Um, Dan, would you like to give us a brief overview and then have us ask some questions? Sure, that works just fine with me. Everybody can hear me? Yes. yes. Excellent. So let's let's start with page three. We'll jump past a bunch of boilerplate. Um, and this report is really a mostly good news, a little bit of, of not so great news, but for the most part, it's, this is a good news report. So on page three at the bottom, you'll see that the liability um, and the assets uh, are on page three and four. So page three has got the assets. So we started out with uh, 3.5 million. We had uh, contributions, which includes um, your contribution to the trust plus what you paid it on the pay go. Um, benefit payments were 437, but we had a negative investment return. Um, as everybody knows, 22 was not a good year for investments. And so we had a bit of a loss there of $133,000. So we ended the year on June 30th, a year ago, at $3.7 million. The following page, top of page four, um, our liability, this is where the good news comes in. Uh, we had a liability of about $8 million at the beginning of the year and uh, normally increases, but then we had an experience gain of $1.4 million, um, principally is because um, your increases in um, uh, premiums was not nearly as high as we thought it might be. And also um, you got some people that elected uh, to go into some cheaper plans. So that was, that was the major elements of the $1.4 million um, gain there. So we finished uh, the year at roughly $7 million. And that increased your funded ratio um, to um, over 50%. Um, you're at 52.6% as your funded ratio versus about 36% uh, where it was um, two years ago when we did, last did a full valuation. So if we per, turn to page five, you'll see that you have in the middle of the page, the OPEB expense. And because you had um, some great gains during the year on the experience side, and you've had some asset gains from previous years that are still being amortized, you'll notice that instead of having an expense, you actually have income of $97,000 there at the end of that uh, middle column. So, um, and that's what happens with the GASB. What they did was they made the rules such that there's, it's highly volatile. You will go from years where there's um, you know, a significant expense uh, to years where you get income. For example, for the fiscal year in 2020, you had an expense of $175,000. And now two years later, it's an income of 97,000. So one of the things I tell uh, people is to really not pay any attention to the expense. It goes into your financials, it gets disclosed, but because of the volatility, it really doesn't mean a lot. So um, anyway, so that's a piece of the good news there. And you'll also see that the bottom of that page that you are at roughly 53% funded status, which I have to believe is one of the best in the state. Um, the only exception to that would be, I think would be Wellesley who did a prop two and a half override and fully funded their OPEB obligation right out of the gate but now they're paying, you know, the bond. Um, uh, sorry, paying taxes on a two and a half override. So, 
uh, a little bit of trickery there to get themselves 100% funded. But at 52.6%, at um, you guys are, um, I would call the poster child for, uh, for good way of attacking the OPEB liability. The following page, um, it just shows the amortization of those investments. I'm, I'm looking at page six, and you'll see experience gains, um, a big gain there, 1.4 million and, and 900,000. Uh, and at the bottom of the page, I show um, your actuarial determined contribution. So this is the normal cost plus the amortization of the unfunded liability of just over $3 million. Um, I also did I look at um, a schedule going out into the future where if you continue to put an OPEB trust amount of roughly $300,000 for the foreseeable future and your pay go still runs at about $400,000, you will actually reach full funded status in 2029. Uh, that was my estimate uh, last June 30. If you continue, the roughly $300,000 extra contribution go into the OPEB trust uh, above and beyond the pay go cost, you'll reach full funded status prior to 2030, which is outstanding. Um, Dave, can I just ask a question in that 505,000 figure? Yeah. Does, I, I'm confused by that number because that's substantially higher than what we're contributing and substantially lower than what the total of what we contribute in the pay as you go. So I'm not sure how this number relates. Okay, so it's actually the opposite of that. You are actually contributing more than that. So this 500,000 includes um, what you might be putting in on a pay go basis. Okay. So, so right now my estimate is roughly $427,000 is your pay go cost. So what really saying is that you only have to put in an additional, you know, $80,000 above what you're already doing on pay go. So if you wanted to cut back on your the extra contribution of 300,000, you could, but if you continue, you'll be fully funded in just five years. That's what I was wondering. Can you say that again a different way? Because I'm still not, I know what you're saying. We only need to put in 80 year, we put in 300. So we're actually doing more than we should or more than we need to, but. How does that connect to the 500? So the way that the 500 is, is the 153,000 is what we call the normal cost, which is just the, the value of one year's accrual for your active employees. The 351,000 is the unfunded liability amortized over a 14 year period, which is what um, the uh, auditors were looking at. So my, my last report had a 16 year amortization and if I drop two years from 20 to 22, it becomes 14, and the 505 to 20 is something the auditors can put on their books as being the actuarial determined contribution. If I said I wanted a five-year amortization, then I'd have to take the 153 uh, plus, um, I think, 600,000, roughly 600,000. And then I'd end up with something in the neighborhood of $750,000. Um, but for purposes of the auditors and putting something on your uh, financial statements, this 505 works for them. All right. I still don't follow, but that's fine. I'll think of it like this. You're saying if we just put in 80 grand a year, we're like, we're a wash. But by putting in 300, we're actually like going way ahead. And like you said, we'll by 2029, projected to be fully funded, it, right? That, that's correct. Uh, another way to think about it is if you did the 14 year amortization, you have 505 minus your 426,000 pay go. So it's an extra 80,000. And, and then you'd be done in roughly 14 years from now. But if you uh, stick yeah, with, so, so if you stick with the 300,000, you'll be done in five years. What is that other number you said 426 or something? Oh, the pay go figure? Um, no, it's fine. I get it now. It's five hundred five netting with four twenty something. Right. Yeah. If you if I go back to um, page three, page, page three, yeah, benefit payments. It says four. It shows four thirty seven on page three. 
but that 437 includes your implicit subsidy, which is a little over 6%. So if you pull out roughly 6%, you get the, the 426. Great, thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Um, so moving on, uh, page eight just shows the premiums, page nine just shows your membership, and then the rest of it is all the boilerplate um, stuff that you don't need to, if you, I guess if you need some sleep aid, you can read that. <laughs> but um, no, you guys are in great shape. Um, I'd say, you know, keep it going. If you can keep going at 300,000, great. Um, then you'll be fully funded roughly in, you know, four or five years from now. Um, I am curious, do you know what the current OPEB trust value is? I mean, this is obviously almost a year old. Do you have an, uh, an estimate of where your trust lies today? I was gonna ask that question. Like you said, this is a year old. It's almost like kind of irrelevant, right? Yeah. From the you... investment perspective. <laughs> Sorry, right? Not from totally. the actuaries. No, 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 no. The stock I mean, market is every business day, so yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're some somewhere over four hundred thousand now, but that's only a guess. That's close, uh, three point eight. Okay, all right. No, so you guys that's are in good. Yeah, you're on track. You're good. What do I compare that to? Um, the three point six on page three. Three six seven five. Got it. So we're up, well, 125 grand. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Clearly, what had you know the latter latter half of 22 is not a good um, uh, six months. It's okay since the beginning of the year, and I'm assuming that um, some of your you know, maybe the 300 thousand went in between July one and today, um, the contribution. So we added a couple people um, this for this next fiscal year in police and fire. So presumably the pay go will go up. No, um, if you got new people, the pay go will not go up because this is retirees only. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what will go up is the normal cost. So that that's a accrual. Um, but if they're young, uh, short service, it's going to be pretty small. So it's a small number. Um, if they are, you know, older, say you hired a police chief from, you know, uh, some other community and has got 25 years of service. Yeah. Now that's going to be a pretty good size liability increase. Um, so the, the roughly $7 million of liability is, is going to go up because of that. Uh, but no, the pay go doesn't do anything until the person retires. So does that, is that... Oh, that relevant? That's what I'm saying. Is that relevant? For, so we just we just had a fire chief or is retiring in a week. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah that that will impact your pay go. Um, it. How old is he? Question. Great, great. Question. But he was only here for three years. Yeah, what did he invest it? Is there a question? He came from. from yeah, he came from New Hampshire. It oh. doesn't matter if he's leaving here, but going to work somewhere else and not. He's going to Maine. Not officially retire. Oh yeah. So if he's only got three years in, he's not vested. I don't think he'll be eligible for your plan. Yes. So okay. the answer. So the answer is zero. What's what? What number do you need for vesting? How many? Ten. Ten. Ten, like ten with this specific employer or or just 10 like 10 within the state, got it. Yeah, yeah, as as uh, as a member of chapter 32, right? So if these, if he worked um, in this state, but a private employer, it doesn't count. It has to be part of a public sector you know, retirement system. So somebody who was a call firefighter wouldn't, those years wouldn't count, right? No, probably not. Um, some retirement systems will include um, uh, a fractional piece for call firefighters, but most exclude call firefighter service. Okay. That's a lot of acceptance. Sure. So Dan, I'm just curious, um, what are the things that could disrupt this completion by 29? Obviously the market and investment return. And then if different healthcare plans we may take on, 
or healthcare costs probably is a lever here. Correct. And yes. Are those the two drivers or are there more? Yeah, those those are the two principal drivers. The other one that'll drive it is if you have uh, people retire earlier than expected and have family coverage. So for example, if you had somebody who became you know, disabled at 45 years old and has got family coverage, um, now you've got to run 20 years with this person without the Medicare offset. So something like that, early retirement, family coverage, uh, that can get expensive. Okay. Um, I have a question. So we use 7.5% as our long-term expectation of investment returns. And clearly we didn't hit that in 2022. Um, and looks like we won't even hit that for the next year. But is that, you still think that's reasonable? I do, uh, because of the way, how it's invested. And I'd also turn, you know, a good uh, segue into page six of the report where we showed the, the history. And you still have, if you look at that, we had uh, roughly $430,000 of losses, but we've got roughly, what, 750,000 in gains. So you're still well ahead and historically well ahead of the 7.5% bogey. Um, so yeah, as long as you um, stay aggressive on the investments, um, you're in print though, right? Um, yes, then, yeah. yeah, so yeah, no problem with the 750. That the long-term basis, print is somewhere around 9% over the last 35 years. I mean, they had a bad year, everybody had a bad year. Right. But look, but looking forward, one of the things I've noticed as investment consultants say, you know, we're I'll just pick a number. Let's say they forecast a seven percent return for a pension fund that um, the consultant is managing. And then they have a bad year, like 22. Then when the consultant comes back in and says, well, going forward, we expect 7.2% long-term. It's like, wait a minute, why did you go from 7% to 7.2? Is it, well, you had a bad year, so everything got knocked down a bit. So now going forward, we expect it to get caught up back to our you know 7%. They're going, ah, okay, makes sense. So now I would expect them to come back after 22 and say, yeah, we're gonna uptick it a little bit. Well, as it happens in February, the uh, consultant to Pritt did exactly that. They came back and upped their long range forecast by 10 bips. I got another one. Oh, so I was just going to say one other question is that I know reading the paper and stuff over the last year or two, they're talking more about print, you know, ESG type investing. And obviously that sort of lifts all boats and drops all boats. Does, <laughs> is there a comp for that? Or do we just all, all 351 communities in Massachusetts roll with that? Or how does that get handled? So there is what they call the print core fund. And the core fund is invest, um, has, almost all 352 communities in it. Um, there are a few retirement systems out there that still use their own consultant and have their own investment. But for the most part, yeah, it's three, it's all 350. Um, and yeah, at the core fund, everybody rides with that boat. Um, and so it goes up, it goes down. Um, they've been doing a fantastic job. If you ever looked at them compared to other states, Massachusetts is always at the top in terms of, you know, top five, top 10, certainly, uh, in terms of net investment return, you know, to communities. So um, it's been working great so far. And I just hope they don't change it too much. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, facetiously call this the Wellesley number since you brought them up as an example. Is there a way <laughs> to calculate the Wellesley number for us? Uh, in terms of the funded funded ratio, like meaning, um, like we just want to cut one check and be done. Oh yeah. So if if you wanted to cut one check and be done, that would be the three point three million dollars um, that I that I show on 
couple different pages. Uh, page four, for example, at the bottom of page four in the middle is a 3.3 million. Um, obviously, before you cut that check, we'd want to update the numbers, but yeah, 3.3 million and you're done. And that, and at that point, all you'd have to do is maintain the normal cost of 156,000 and plus interest and inflation. And you would use the trust to pay your pay go. So the trust would be sending the checks to, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield and, uh, you know, Harvard Pilgrim and whomever. Um, and um, the only thing you guys would have to budget is the 156,000 annual piece and then just watch for gains and losses that might move the 156 up and down as you vacillate on either side of 100%. Right. And then to the degree we don't want to cut a check that big, obviously cutting a check anywhere in between the 300 grand and the three mil obviously shortens the time frame, right? Brings that yep. 29 close. Yep, yep, exactly right. Any other questions for Dan? We're good. Thank you, Dan. Oh, you're very <laughs> welcome. Yeah, keep up the good work, guys. You're doing great. <laughs> good to see you. Thanks. All right. Thank Have you. a good evening. Thank bye you. bye. <clears throat> Mostly funny that I did it over. Yeah. Doing an ad Oh, okay. So they're paying interest on it. Oh. Um, uh, they were it's a it's a it's an arbitrage play right yeah. because yeah. if you if you yeah. issue the bond at three and a half and you believe you're getting the seven and a half then you're yeah. ahead of the game by the four percent right yeah. how what's the duration on that bond do you know how long are they doing that for unless it was like 23 years it's like a long time that's a long play yeah. Yeah. So i think they're playing my interest it's going over, but right. now it's right. time to For the yeah. new guy here, that 300 plus we're putting into, where's that that's coming from the investment? Where's it coming from? We've been, this year we paid it out of taxes. In the past years, we've paid it out of reserves. Actually, that 3.8 will go up in July when we have to pay Right. You have to put it, it's annual so town meeting money. will become $300,000 more in July, and they add the, uh, the, 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 the three eight is the current market value, right? So three eight goes to full one. So now the market value is four point one. Taking out of reserves the last year. So yeah, 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 because she did. Right. 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 Four point one. Yeah. <clears throat> but I guess in, you probably see where I'm thinking. It's just like you know, if if we have discussions in the future about being okay with lower. Reserve and we take some extra reserve to put in there. I mean, you look at what is cash is probably earning in our reserves, and it's probably the minimum versus right, right. seven and a half. So it's even a it's even a wider spread, right? Right. They had issue a bond, probably paying three and a half to seven and a half. We might be looking at two versus seven and a half. And that's why we decided to pay it out of reserves, even though it rolled levels. It's because yeah. it made sense. Um, the next item on the agenda is the. New tier water rate proposal from the Water Resource Task Force, and I believe I everyone received the deck. Yeah. Um, so we have Steve Gang here um, to kind of just brush over it quickly, Steve, and then we'll ask questions. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. So um, may I share the screen? I sent it. Use the attachment. Can you enable? Same email. Can you uh, permit Sorry, me to share ahead. my screen? Can you permit me to share my screen? Someone needs, someone needs to hit the advanced button under screen share and permit other people to use it. I have to make him a host. I think I hit you, right? Yes, you could try making me co-host. That might work too. See if that works. Yes, that works. All right. 
Let me share this screen and pop up onto it. Yes, can you see the uh, title page? Uh, not yet. Yes. There we go. Okay. So um, to cut to the chase here, uh, we've recommended to the select board um, a change in the typical annual uh, increases in water rates, which are usually a few percent uniform across the what are now six different tiers of quarterly usage. And uh, we've done that in order to begin the process of having the rates contribute to a, a more integrated approach to encouraging conservation, which is also going to involve a higher level of, of uh, communication and education and maybe even some some uh, uh, forensics and and uh, advice to to our largest water users, be they uh, residential or commercial. But this step um, is part of a series of recommendations we made. We're preparing. We, I'll be delivering in half an hour to the select board with an emphasis on number two here. Although number two is connected with number one and number three, we're, we're also recommending a pilot test, which we're ready to launch with two different vendors for new digital water meters. We are overdue for water meter replacement, which means our meters are probably under reading the accurate uh, flows. And uh, there's been a generation shift in the technology of meters. So that that will help with conservation because users will, for instance, if they care to be able to look at their water usage in almost real time on their smartphone. And as I said, we also plan to increase awareness and education. The amounts we're going up, this is our current rates, which as you can see are six tiers ranging from $7 to nine and change per hundred cubic feet. Uh, we're also recommending a shift to gallons because no one understands what a cubic foot is of water. Um, and it would shift us somewhat in our current position, which is kind of in the middle, slightly above the average of 140 communities surveyed by the MWRA. This is for a comparable usage. It happens that Manchester uh, users, mainly households, uh, use considerably more water than almost every other community in. Massachusetts. So there's quite a lot of room for conservation. Most of that usage uh, increase is differential is due to irrigation in the summer. Uh, we also studied local rates and they, they're kind of all over the map, but ours, which is the dashed line here, is again, you know, kind of in the middle of the pack today with very little differential from the lowest use category to the highest tier. So we take these current rates and we recommend as of now, uh, so July 1st, that the lowest two tiers be consolidated essentially into one, almost the same cutoff, and that their rate be reduced. This will generate a relatively small savings. Most of these, uh, I think it's 1,100 households out of the 2,000 in town are in this category they'll save you know, $100 a year on average, maybe, maybe 200. Tier th three becomes our second tier and that goes from seven to $8, so a modest increase. Tier four, about the same, from $8 to 15, about the same usage. Tier five and six get combined into one tier in our recommendation and about doubled from around $9 blended to $20 per cubic foot. Just for reference, right now, this system in red charges about a penny a gallon on average, you know, eight tenths of a cent here and 1.1 cent here or something like that. And this would raise it to about uh, two cents a gallon. Um, and as you know, if you buy, you know, the least expensive Poland Spring package, you can get, let's say at Costco, you're paying on the order of $6 a gallon. For drinking water. Where can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I know what you said about irrigation that that's probably one of the biggest drivers, but if you just set that aside, like 
if you just took a house with I don't know, say four people, five people with no irrigation, where where do you think where does a household like that drop? Those households, well, you have lots of data. We did a 10-year analysis of all accounts um, in our system, commercial and residential and governmental and everything else. Um, so that's what you're describing is actually more than half of the total count of households, as I said, around 1,100 or 1,200 or 2,000. And their average usage, if I remember correctly, is around 45, 40 to 45 gallons per person per day. So for a family of four, that would come out to something like uh, 60,000 gallons a year, maybe 80,000 gallons a year. I can't do the numbers right in my head. So um, which, which tier does that drop in? They would be in tier, currently in tier one or two and clearly in tier one for our system. And that would be year round because they don't, they don't increase their usage a whole lot in the summer. Maybe they take a few more showers or wash a little more laundry, but you know, their basic behaviors in terms of indoor water use don't change very much. Okay. That answer your question. Yeah. Ready. Wouldn't that suggest that the water meter replacement on those households wouldn't yield much of a benefit for the cost of doing it? I mean, I could see where it might help the bigger ones, but if half the households are already in a pretty good zone. Yes, you're right. If the goal was purely to to get more accurate information. Uh, you'd be right. We could let those things just basically rust out in place. Um, but we have other goals. Um, the first step in conservation is to try to reduce this um, really, forgive me, but outrageous use of drinking water to irrigate lawns in the summer. Um, and it it should be doable over the three to five year time period with a combination of carrots and help and sticks in terms of the rates. But long term, the conservation purpose is to get every household to be more conscious of water usage. And that means, you know, waiting till your dishwasher is full to run it or um, reducing the amount of flow every time you flush the toilet. You know, they're things that most people have heard of because they've been around for 10 or 20 years in the, in the press and in government, but nobody's really put any emphasis on them. So ultimately we'll want people to be just a little more conscious of water, whether they're currently very light users uh, who, who won't be touched by these rate changes or whether they're heavy users. Make sense? Yeah, um, one further thought on that. Um, I know, me personally, I have a lead water service line and they recommend running it for two minutes before you try to use it. Um, so wouldn't that be a priority to try to eliminate those lead service lines that are remaining yes. in town? Would yeah, that be absolutely. in a water meter replacement program? And that's, that's your own uh, service line from the public main to your house? From the public main, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, and I know that your, there's a means yeah, to, but, for the property owner to cover to the property line, and then the town covers right. from the property line to the street. But um, it would definitely be more efficient, I would think, for the town to run that type of. I mean, isn't that what was done on Pine Street and uh, some of those other where they replaced the service lines? Uh, Chuck, uh, you care to comment? I don't know when you put you on the spot, but if you're listening and you're here. Chuck Dam, do you want to speak to that? You have to respect that Chuck has a brand new baby in the household and he may he may be otherwise occupied. Yeah, Congratulations, time. Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Congrats, <laughs> um, isn't that kind of apples and oranges? Yeah. Because we're talking about usage versus yeah. uh, quality and, and perhaps uh, well again lead issue. the lead, I mean the usage of running. I know like I try to wash my dishes before I fill a pitcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I could see, yeah. yeah. You sure. see this number nine is it's last, but not at all least. Yeah. Um, we need, if we can afford it, we need to find ways to be able to afford accelerating the replacement of the water mains, which will save everybody money in the long term because right now they're full of corrosion. They have to be flushed much more frequently than new mains would be. 
and they tend to spring leaks, sometimes very big ones. Um, so part of that could be, you know, remediation of the lead issue. I don't, I just, we didn't study that, so I have no idea how extensive it is, but it's an interesting point. It might be good to put that in the study. Yeah. So in any event, we're, um, sorry, we're uh, here with a change, uh, and I have a couple of indications of what that'll mean. This is what, what you were asking before. The current average annual bill is, this is water, not sewer. Most of, most of these households, 1,100 of them, are on town sewer. Most of these households are not, because they tend to be in the areas we haven't sewered yet, Masconomo, Proctor, Boardman, Summer Street, et cetera. Um, but for these households, it'll be about a $100 average reduction. For these, about a $100 increase. For these, about a $300, $400 increase. And for these, about a $4,000 increase. And uh, the select board has asked us, in light of this kind of numbering, to make sure that we have in place a letter to notify people long before they get their next bill under these new rates that says you may experience something like a 30 or 40 percent increase depending on how you use water this summer um, and invite them both to pilot test the meters if they're interested and to uh, come in to uh, ask questions if they need advice about better ways to irrigate better ways to landscape and even better ways to source your own irrigation water. Steve, why are you recommending a reduction in the lower tier? I don't quite get that. Um, well, it's not a necessity. You're right. It's just uh, kind of consistent with the fact that this behavior, the behavior of households down here, staying well below the state, the state has a mandate that says you should be as a community below 65 gallons per capita per person per day. Uh, Manchester's at 50% more than that. Uh, but these 1,100 households are down in the 40, 45 gallons per capita range. And I guess we saw it as kind of an acknowledgement that they're already doing what we call pretty effective phase one conserving of drinking water. That's a carrot. Yes, and, and a, you know, a way to maybe get a little attention from them, because otherwise, if, if we change this 3%, no one's going to notice, and that's what happens most years. Um, we also considered the alternative of making it free for Tier 1, uh, which didn't pencil out as well. There's very little revenue uh, increment or loss tied up here, but we settled on a, a reduction of about... 40%. We also looked at what it would do to revenues, quite important. Currently, we, our water division is supposed to generate about one and a half million dollars a year. If we put in serious drought restrictions and people follow them, we have shortfalls, as I believe we did last year. But this is a 10 year average um, at the current rates. If behavior does not change under these new um, rates, uh, the water division will collect $2.3 million. If there's some significant conservation by the large users, namely we said a 50% reduction, I think that's um, wildly optimistic given the track record of other towns that have done this, which have experienced no elasticity at all, meaning people simply pay more um, and use the same amount of water. But if we did, that would be 1.6 million still north of the current uh, the current revenue flow, which is essentially set, one, one and a half million is essentially set to cover the operating costs of the water treatment plant and the distribution system and new meters where they're required as replacements. It's only if there's a dramatic conservation, meaning you say a two thirds reduction by the top 400 users plus 20% of the next tier, the next 400 users, there we would see a shortfall. And we put this in just for a test case. Uh, no one believes that anything like this will happen. We think it'll be quite close, if not on this number, given uh, 
the track record of people's behavior. And I think that's about it. We did look ahead to the possibility of further reductions in tier one and further increases, oops, sorry, in tier uh, three and four. And, you know, these are just talking points at this point. We, this is our recommendation to the select board. And then it's literally wait and see what happens in the next 12, 18 months before we come forward with this kind of recommendation. And I should say that if we got all the way to phase three, we would be way ahead of the curve that most experts believe is eventually coming to most towns, uh, including towns that are struggling with much greater shortage than we ever experience, the towns that depend on the Ipswich River, for example. But if you if you think about what's going on here, we don't charge for the water and we never have. We charge for treating it and handling it, um, which is why it's only a penny a gallon. Um, and in fact, keeping it pure at the source is getting increasingly expensive, as you may know from the PFAS findings. And ensuring that it's safe from climate change and other threats is also getting increasingly expensive. So we think it's appropriate that the water actually begin to have a cost that is reflected in the rates. And we've, we've been deliberate about that in creating these. But as I say, these are just talking points for now. And we'll see what they, uh, what, what kinds of behavior changes we can uh, create in the next 12 or 18 months. There's more, but that's essentially it. I expect the select board will vote tonight, although I, I'm not guaranteeing that. And, um, you know, we'd love to get any feedback or suggestions from you folks as well. So, Steve, yeah, I just have two questions. One is these 60 households that are at tier four, are they located in areas where they must drill, their, they might just drill their own wells and get off the system? And have you thought about that? And <clears throat> is, is that just nothing you can do about that? And I guess the second question is, there are a number of households in town that have apartments or two households, but share one meter. We are one of those. And um, as you know, we were flagged early on and then suddenly someone said, oh my God, I didn't know you had a, a tenant. <laughs> and how do you put in a second meter for that? Or how does that, how does that get resolved or does it not get resolved? Yeah, those are both great questions. Let me take them in opposite order, Maury. First one, um, you're, we need we need to reflect the fact that they're multi-unit um, dwellings using a single meter, and you're you're a mild case with just two units. Um, the properties on on uh, uh, Desmond and Union Street and elsewhere they have multiple units, um, which right now pay at a rate even loading place pays at a rate that reflects the total buildings usage in the case of loading place the total community so the simplest way we could handle that which we're recommending is to divide by the number of units in order to set the tier rates and then charge people a pro rata share as they are today um, in terms of your first question we're actually going to be encouraging people to explore private wells um, which are not inexpensive and they're not guaranteed, but um, the limited experience so far, especially in the Smith's Point, Proctor, Masconomo area, in the Boardman area, and um, other kind of outlying uh, high usage areas in town, the experience has been pretty good, meaning many of the wells have produced perfectly usable irrigation water of the few that are drilled every year. Some of them produce saline water and can't be used. Others produce water that, as is typical around here, is relatively high in iron and manganese. And that can be a headache. It's not uh, dangerous to the plant life, but um, in an extreme case, it turns your lawn slightly red colored, which is probably not your cup of tea. 
Um, but the good news is that for all of those locations, our hydrologists um, have determined that there will be no negative interaction with the aquifer that serves Lincoln Street well, nor with the one that serves uh, Round Pond, our, our second production well out in Hamilton. So we, we feel fine about encouraging people to do it. I, I expect it'll be kind of a, a third choice for people after they examine whether they can change irrigation practices. Many, you probably know this if you drive around town or walk jog in the morning, many systems just go on routinely every day on a timer. Uh, some of them have rain sensors, some of them don't, uh, and they're spraying in the air. And that is so far from intelligent best practice of irrigating. Um, there's some simple changes that you can make with that kind of system. If you water every day, your grass will grow very shallow roots. And if you stop watering for a couple of days, your grass will die out. It'll go into hibernation essentially, but it'll turn gray, brown, and uh, unsightly. If you water heavily less frequently, your grass will grow deeper roots and will be more resilient against drought. So that's number one. Number two would be landscape changes to stuff that isn't quite so uh, dependent on um, frequent irrigation. And third level would be sourcing your own water. Some people may, in fact, if they're building new construction or they're venturesome, they might try gray water systems, which are permitted now uh, under Mass DEP regulations in Title V, uh, but they're very uncommon, um, or a private well. That's more of an answer than you, <laughs> you expected, I'm sure. Yeah. So I was very glad to see the um, Gordon College mentioned in there because they have been expanding parking and uh, that is really close to our reservoir. And um, yes. yeah, uh, maybe expand to see what kind of pest management they're using on their lawns as well for the runoff. But also I had two other ones that, that weren't on there that I was wondering about. And the, the biggest one is the golf course. And then the second one is Route 128 and whether there needs to be a, a no salt zone somewhere where the Western Woods Aquifer crosses into the ponds. Um, those yep, it, would be, it would be very helpful to do that. Plus where the Lincoln Street culvert transits under because Lincoln, uh, not sorry, Sawmill Brook transits under because Sawmill Brook essentially feeds interchanges with the aquifer under our Lincoln Street well. So you may know or you may not know that the Lincoln Street well has experienced steady uh, now uh, concerning increases in sodium chloride levels. Not a health issue for most people, but if you're on a restricted health uh, salt diet, it could be an issue. And it's very hard to filter out, but possible essentially without desalination, which is terribly expensive. So um, it's much better idea to try to prevent it. And it, it, it has to be to some extent, road salt from 128, from our own streets and conceivably from our new parking lots at the high school and the elementary school, although there's a firm resolution there to use other ice melts besides sodium chloride. Yeah, if we can only get the tea to use something besides that blue ice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. They pour it on. But that we're really that's more a harbor pollution than than a uh, yeah, Water. yeah, that's that's further down on the list, but you're absolutely right. That's the other issue with irrigating. A lot of the properties that are the heaviest users uh, directly drain into the harbor or the ocean. So um, it's estimated that less than 30% of the chemistry they apply to their perennial ryegrass actually reaches the plant. Um, most of it runs off or yeah. uh, evaporates. <laughs> When the health department first mentioned this study and, and suggested it, it, it was there was more of an emphasis on the protection side of it, and uh, you might want to move those things up the list a little bit. Um, would be, yeah, what struck me initially um, that that was so well, far down. The protection. I yeah. Couldn't agree more. If you're talking about purity of the water and contaminants and whatnot, and now that. 
in case Chuck is still out of earshot, I'll just shower some praise on his abilities and how he's managing the system and what he's thinking about how do you deal with all of the issues in front of him from the mundane stuff like replacing old pipes to the highly technical stuff like how do you remediate PFAS? We're lucky, we're lucky to have him and, and Nate as well. Um, exceptional folks. Do anybody, does anybody have any other questions of Mr. Gang? Just one real quick one. This is like a math question, I guess. You said only 3% of households will see their annual water bills rise significantly. And I think you said 1,100 households. Is that right? I'm um, backing into 33. Is that, yeah. That's, yeah, um, it would be. It's this uh, It's this 60 on your screen. Oh, 60. Okay. Out of 2,000 uh, yeah. that fall yeah. into tier, tier four. And of course, if they change their behavior, they may slip back down into tier three, yeah, yeah. but oh, I missed yeah. the 60. That's the number I was looking for. Yeah. The 60. That's Thank the you. number. Yep. And the other thing about that is that that's a, you know, that's a group of people. Uh, I'm going to use the collective. We here, we, we know who we are. Um, and it, you know, it isn't, these are folks that, you know, come to many of them come to town meeting. They come to, they serve on boards and commissions. They uh, have run for office. They, belong to clubs and and uh, do gardening and and it's there are plenty of other ways to to reach them besides the uh, you know the club of really high rates so I'm kind of optimistic because of that number um, we prepared a list of, of about 400 to to be safe so it would be the 60 plus the 255 plus some flux over the last 10 years in terms of who might have been temp sometime in the high usage level. And those are the folks we intend to notify if the select board acts on these rates. Um, and of course, we had to purge out the multi-unit um, properties in there and other exceptions. Let me just, Chuck Dan has his hand raised. Let's, let me just okay. call Dan and Maury has a question. Chuck. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that I, I made it back over. I was on the uh, on my computer on the uh, select board, so I didn't. I, don't, I know Steve was wrapping up. I don't know if there was any questions that I needed to respond to or other thoughts that Steve put out there that you guys were want to call me. But I'm here if you if you need anything. Uh, Thanks, Chuck. Chuck. Just as relates to the uh, water meters, we uh, we had a a difficult process of trying to up, update water meters about, I don't know, 12 years ago or so. Uh, is the thought that if we go down that path of, of updating the water meters is that we would contract that out? Uh, yeah, that's that's how I envision it happening. We would do an RFP. I, I'm sure Steve talked about the idea of doing a pilot. So, you know, we get some information now about a you know year from now, we would be hopefully receiving uh, or maybe even less than a year. Uh, receiving, you know, qualified proposals from vendors for both the purchasing of the meters and the installation. Uh, we could do it, you know, in separate contracts, but generally, um, you know, we would we would contract that out. I would I wouldn't be able to guarantee our guys to get that in a timely manner. You know. Before. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Warren, did you have a question? Yeah, just Steve, on um, slide number 10, um, there's the current rates that are being proposed. And then there's sort of a phase two recommendation for 24 and 25. Is Are you all voting and recommending that those be put into place? Or are you really starting at the kind of current 24 rates, see how it goes, and then evaluate from there? The latter, exactly. These are, as I said, these are kind of our talking points or stalking horses so that maybe we can lessen the uh, the shock value of these kinds of numbers, which are quite high compared to where we are today. Um, but we're not sure that it'll ever be necessary to get up to these numbers, depending on the reaction to these and the success of the other, the integrated efforts to to uh, make people more aware of their water usage and their options for conserving drinking water. So can I have a consensus of the board of whether we support these changes or not? 
Yeah, they seem yeah. prudent to me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I would agree. Yeah, you know, the worst later. <laughs> well, I, I would recommend prioritizing the protection for the, the water meter overall of the programs. Is, oh. I would adjust the priorities. Of yeah. I guess what I'd say to that is if this works out the way that most of us expect it to, it's going to generate some additional revenue, and then that revenue can be used for protection. Right. Okay. So, yep, that's a yeah. good idea. Yep. Good. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for time and attention and your all your work. Thank you. Okay. Out how to shut this off. Operations, right? Just solve that. That's true. <laughs> okay. I just felt the consensus yeah. of the board made sense, don't yeah. you? I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, they're voting on it next time. I don't know if they will. It's not an agenda vote on it. They're just giving an update to it. Um. So the next item on the agenda is the town accountant, Andrea. Oh, Andrew, oh, sorry. Oh, boy, that was bad. Um, so we have, I, I, I sent the spreadsheet around to people of the transfer requests. And then today, Andrea sent one more, which was 25,000 from water salaries to water expenses, right? Um, so did people have a chance to take a look at the spreadsheet? I looked at it, but there's too many different colors. Okay. <laughs> so what I did is on the, on the top, I just went through and I list out all the different funding possibilities that I saw extra money in some of the budgets, um, which I thought you'd like to see. Mm -hmm. um, and then down below, I went through and the expected and known transfers. Um, the colors just mean that I just trying to match up like where, what I was going to use for a funding source to cover the transfer. Um, so down below, I start off with the appeals salaries. Um, we're in a twelve hundred dollar deficit right now, and I talked to Gail. It's like you know, it's a couple of meetings and some minutes still, so we need about six hundred to. Get through year end. Um, so that's 2000. Police salaries, um, we have an expected deficit of 65,000. 40,000 is being covered by the police law enforcement grant. Um, I just like, I know I was talking to Todd about this. So I just wanted to note that since we don't have dispatch anymore, we won't be getting that you know, 24 plus thousand dollars a year. Um, so in case we have, I know we're added. Policemen next year, so you know, over time and everything's gonna be good, right? So, should yeah. be. Yeah. Just want to throw that out there. <laughs> we shouldn't have overages in any public safety salary over time, in my opinion. Um, I've said that the past few weeks. We're going to be filming 25 um, to cover that gap. And then I was told that there's a possibility of two severance packages that need to be paid out. Um, total sixty thousand dollars. So that means we've we've agreed to, to terminate positions. The you know, dispatchers, to you know, it's for them to stay on, and if they stay on through, then they get okay. Uh, so that's dispatchers, not police. Correct. Okay, got it. Yeah. I was wondering why we were getting rid of these. <laughs> well, you just added to. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an obvious question, but that's a one-time cost, yes. right? And like you said, that's so that they stay on until at some point in time, until June 30th, yeah. which is when the, the dispatch, the regional took over March 1st. And so from March 1st to June 30th, they were doing updating records and stuff that had to be updated. Oh, okay. And originally, I think when they agreed, when they we were, when we were moving dispatch, they're like, oh, we're going to be out of a job. And we're like, well, no, we're going to transfer July 1, but then it was getting pushed out. But there already had the agreement that it could stay through June 30th. Okay. But I believe there was a heavy records transfer that had to occur. Yeah. But the more is fine. Obviously, it's a one time. Yep. 
Yes. One time un unforeseen. Um, the next one is the health salaries. Um, those that five thousand is for more hours for the public health nurse. Um, she did some more work and some complaint um, work before the new public health director came on. So we don't expect that type of thing going forward because of the new health director. Correct. Okay. Um, and Sydney Beach and Life Guard salaries. Um, I talked to Cheryl and. You talked, you know, for FY24, like, you know, increasing the rate. So that went into effect this month. Um, obviously, the budget for this month, but it's budgeted for FY24. So again, I don't expect this in the next yeah. year. Um, Selectman's office. Um, the town reports and the warrant were much more expensive because it was significantly more pages um, to print than has been in the past. Oh, verbose. Yeah. Well, shortly well, next not. year. <laughs> Off the word here. <laughs> yeah, those bylaws are pretty. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the town hall in common. So the twenty-five thousand estimated electricity needs. I looked into this, and I realized that last year I probably should have carried money over because um, we ended up paying April, May, and June last year in July, August, and September. And so I want to catch up so that we're actually paying for July through June. So that means I need also July, August, and September. No, I need April, May, and June. So yeah. technically I'm paying April, May, and June twice. twice. Okay. Um, is, is the cost in town hall since we switched to the new heating system are those electricity costs more than we expected they would pay? No. No. It's actually, like, all right, we're steady. Yeah. Okay. Steady. Because it just seems to me like, I mean, I happened to be in town hall one day and was at one office, and the heat was, like, flaring out. And I just question how much control we want individuals to have over a heating system. Um, it should be programmable it, so that they're, like, free. Well, the, what the person said to me is it had been really cold when they came in in the morning. Okay. So they jacked the heat exactly. up. It was, I think it was yeah. a three-day weekend or something. I don't know. But it, it was it was like 70 degrees outside, mind you. It wasn't, you know, and it just seemed, it, it just seemed to me like, I don't, it seems like, to, like there should be some type of controls around what people can do with the heating system if we're paying the bill. That's all. So one question, it, it, so it sounds like the electric cost of this building is constant and we're doing AC now in addition to heating, which is a good thing. So yeah. probably means that we're getting more efficient heating and able to cover the cost of uh, AC, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I, I know the, the past six months, there was a really big rate hike by, by the state and I, they were gonna do a correction for this Next it six months. It didn't, didn't go down. <laughs> it went down a little bit, but not the 50% they increased it. Right. As I wait for 18 months for my solar. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a little, but no, they, they decreased it some, but not all the way down. Because I was wondering if with the decrease, it would be better to pay that in the next year's budget again. Well, the bills right. come up. I was going to say, we're locked in to our rates through December of 2023. Okay. They're actually going to go have. up um, January. Okay. Um, so, so I was like, I'd like to catch up. Yeah, if know, we're, if we're caught in the rate. Year. Can you just explain that one more time? Sorry, the catch up thing. So last year, instead of paying um, April, May, and June, in fiscal 22, mm -hmm. I paid it in 23. But I should have carried money over from. 22 and I didn't. So she's paying 15 months during this fiscal year. So it's really to catch up. It's, yes. to, it's to basically. She paid nine eight, months the year before. Right. Why, why, why did we do that back then? Well, the back then, the um, Happy Hollow bills, I think I've mentioned that to you before, it's like National Grid bills us, and then we wait for the credit to show up at National Grid, and then we get the Happy Hollow bill. Um, that show, matches up with the credits in National Grid. Um, they've been running like months behind. Um, and I just, I didn't, I missed. So she didn't that. have the invoices to pay. Right. 
I didn't carry the money forward. I don't have them, but I'm estimating. Okay. okay. So I'm catching it. So is that same system in place, but you're pre you're basically estimating forward, even though you don't have the invoices. Right. So I'm probably gonna end up carrying money over into July, August. Hopefully not September. <laughs> not. So that's that one. Um like a you know, we're deciding to make more salaries and overtime than I calculated previously. So I think that original budget amount I calculated on just the salaries, not overtime. So a little bit. Um, election registration. Um, we've had, you know, we have another town meeting that we weren't expecting. Um, and then the town meeting sound costs were more um, than we were really so stellar. I know these special town meetings cost money to run and if we're going to have one this June, I really think we should try to avoid having one if we can. I mean, we, we did. That was one of the reasons why I voted to for the well, cola. One one reason to have one in the fall is so we can adjust the date for the annual town meeting to the end of April to give us more time. That would that's not on the June agenda. Can we put it in? It's and then, like for the fall, we kind of get all the planning and bylaws and all the like, kind of really kind of focus on non financial stuff in the fall. So you know, I, I have a concern regarding the, the resident sticker prices and fulfillment. I don't see that we're saving any time in town hall on labor. And it seems to me like it's costing us a lot more. I mean, I went in online, ordered beach tags. I had to go down to town hall to town clerk to get my beach tags. It would have been easier for them to just take my check and give me the beach tags. They have to get, the, they have to go through the list of all the beach tags. And apparently they have hundreds that have me up and distributed because people haven't picked them up. I'm, I'm really concerned about this new fulfillment system being too expensive. Yeah, I, I agree. That didn't seem to be working. Are we taking a revenue hit on it for um, like a percentage? Is whoever's coordinating it holding yeah. a percentage for this? Going to be paying something. Yeah, a little bit. I haven't done the exact percentages. I mean, it's lost system. in the mail, or is it? Can you sometime do the calculation as to what we're paying for all of this? Beach sticker and anything we've processed, we've changed on what we had paid before just to see. What was the argument to change the whole process? It was supposed to be easier. And last year we went over by seven or eight thousand dollars because it was worse the than mailing. they thought. Yeah, because um, we thought we, they thought they, we could include the stickers and in with the motor vehicle excise, but we couldn't. It. So they ended up having us mail that completely separate. And this year was a separate mailing too. Yeah, because we. <clears throat> And it's too, it would cost more for them to stuff the stickers in with the motor vehicle excise than to just send them separately. Wait, yeah. really? The way the company says, because like they have a machine that's a, you know, that prints out your one pager and folds it and puts it in the envelope. Whereas if you have two pages, they have to have manually. Human. Yeah. Put it in. They're on a voice cast. I think that's just something we need to look at before we do the uh, take into consideration in the 2025 budget. Mm -hmm. It disturbs me. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like a violation of the bidding broke, don't fix it because it wasn't broke. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they tried to mm -hmm. improve it. But... Right. It Police, well, I'm just going to lump these two together. But the police and COA van um, and vehicle repairs. Um, they, we've had like all the COA vans and one of the police um, vehicles all failed inspection. Um, so we had to do brakes and electrical harnesses, all sorts of stuff. So that was definitely unexpected. Are they not driving incorrectly? No, they, their argument is that they sit out by the salt water and oh. the salt erodes. Um, because the COA vans are pretty new, aren't they? 2014. Uh, oh, we're getting here. We are getting, yeah. I thought so too. I thought, they were I thought we bought some recently. 
or, or this coming yes, year? Yes, they haven't come yet. Oh, okay. One's oh. coming the end of the summer and the other one's coming next year. Okay. What, sorry, go ahead. I was thinking maybe if we just repaired one for 8,000, maybe we only get one new one instead of two and take this out of next year's budget. I mean, if we just right, put we eight grand. grand for, yeah, we already got a grant for two of them. And then with this one, with the, um, these vans, um, Nancy's been floating them, and it looks like we could probably get thirty to forty thousand dollars if we sell it next year. Um, so at least for some of this, these repair costs. But otherwise, yeah, like a bridge job is a fairly standard thing. Right. You have to do periodically. Well, that supports um, the idea to pay, you know, June first for next year out of next year's budget. Well, but I think yeah, what, Andy's, what Andy's saying that I agree is eight grand to do a break job in some hoses. That just sounds high. Is that, is, that, is, that a, is that another public? Is that like a prevailing wage that you like the wage for? Over to... I mean, four four sets of discs and pads should be two grand tops. Right? Yeah, and now some hoses another five hundred bucks. I don't know. It was for multiple vans. Yeah. Um, oh, it's for multiple. Yeah. How many? Three, I believe. Okay. That's how many we have. Yeah. Well, we have four. Can you can you go back to the the parking clerk thing there? Sure. So what is that? That's eleven grand just for new parking tickets. So new parking tickets and um, the sticker fulfillment dog tag resident sticker. Like when we ordered them, the price of those went up. Um, and the new parking tickets. Okay. Because we raised the price. Well, old tickets will look good. Now, when we have a lot of old tickets, I mean, shouldn't we use all the old tickets before we change the rates? We lose the revenue. I don't know. When when did we raise the rates? Um, okay, so the new the new parking tickets that have already they're the higher. So if we're, when I know it crosses fiscal years, but if we were to look at ticket revenue for this spring summer. Should be. It should be higher. higher. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we'll get a glimpse of it, I guess, April, May, June. Uh, I don't think they're really starting some of the Memorial Day weekend, so let's see it too. Okay. I certainly have seen her. I've seen her. Yeah, 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 checking all those cars. And I know she's like, hey, those people have been coming in. I was going to stay up for two seconds. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. She's like, nope. <laughs> Good excuse. Go over there. <laughs> <laughs> she looks it up on our little. Speak, Very good. Speaking of revenue, and I don't want to jump off this, but just super high level. We, that's later. Right. That's that's later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just get rid of these transfers first, if you don't mind. Mike. Yep. Yep. But we have other items on here. Um, I think the water operating expenses. Um, that's increased costs of chemicals and materials, um, and then. We hadn't finalized quite yet when the budget was established for FY23, the contracted services for wood and earth burn. So that ended up being about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 more than what we budgeted for them. For the water treatment plan. First thought. That's the new one. Oh, yeah. okay. So they found some more. So we're doing transfers of 198000 and we have 238 of expense savings for a net of forty grand. Excluding the revenue differentials. <laughs> and I know for like funding plus, I took like the biggest amounts. Um, and I saw, I know there's going to be a lot of like smaller term decks too. So in the end, that expects to be more. So that, that reserve fund, that top row, that 76,420, is that's that us. is that the total amount in there or that no, that's just the amount you're suggesting to pull out? That's what's in there right now. That's what's in there. I'm out of it earlier. Yeah. So are there any more questions on this? Just the police vehicle one. Um, can we, uh, is there, we're replacing police vehicles this year. Can this be one of the vehicles we replace as opposed to fixing it? We're replacing admin vehicles, not police vehicles. So there's not police vehicles. Like we skipped it. So, And I think the admin vehicles are supposed to be electric. So that might help. Yeah, we, have electric charger. <laughs> we got four behind this, this station. Um, 
so I'm wondering if we can have one motion to fund all these transfers and then authorize me to sign the FinCom transfers on behalf of the board instead of going through each one individually. Because the net impact is like you said, 40 grand drops down. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. I would make a motion that we um, vote to approve the transfers as detailed in spreadsheet of yeah. Um, so a total of hundred ninety-eight thousand four hundred. I'm looking at a older one, but yes, that's good. Yeah, uh, from a revenue available revenue of two hundred thirteen seven twenty. Two thirty-eight seven twenty. Okay. And water revenues. <laughs> that's all right. And we're all right, right with uh, dropping on the reserve another seventy-six thousand. Well, it goes away at the end of the year anyway. There's no, there's no choice. This is this is our income reserve. So the twenty dollars left will go into free cash. I see. Really I thought we that. drained it on the overtime fire. No, we, we we used a big chunk. Yeah, yeah. but we didn't drain it because okay. it's a. Yeah. 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 The, at, at June 30, everything just, yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, it goes to the rainbow. Um, so do I have a second? I'll second. Mike seconds. Any discussion? Take a vote. Mike? Yes. Maury? Yes. Tom? Yes. Dean? Yes. Andy? Yes. Sarah votes yes. Okay. Would you send those out to everybody today or just with Sarah? The, the second uh, just so came to me and I failed to. Oh, okay. Yeah, when are you I, a chance? I was dealing with a plumber to fix my right. lack of hot water. We don't want to hear words. <laughs> if, um, yeah, we don't want excuses. But if you just forward <laughs> that out, that'd be great. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries. I'll check. I was <laughs> being given a lecture about a, a censure or something, which I still have no clue what it is. Yeah, in my oil. Oh. Stop working. Sheets my oil. Okay. The next was okay. So we've done the line items and the FinCom reserve. Now the next item was the estimated transfer to free cash and balance as a 7123. I think we have the expense side, but Mike is looking for the revenue side. Mm -hmm. So the revenue side looks like we're uh, on track same percentage as last year. Which is one. Um, $230,000. About $430,000. Plus wow. the 40000 from expenses. Mm -hmm. So it's about 470000 So that's the, that's the net. Two, two reserve, two free cash. The net net. Yes. So to say the same thing a different way, I think initially we had targeted it's going to end up at like 9.8%, 9.6%, but clearly this will push us over 10%. But we did use 1.6 um, free cash. So, like when I, so the DR has like a, I've seen it, like they, they do the calculation, they probably can use your balance at the end of the year. So, you take your fund balance, um, revenues, expenses, that you close out, um, any real estate outstanding. Um, grant deficits, any free cash that you voted at town meeting, um, and your deferred revenue, and it came to three point two million dollars estimate for year end. So that's that's three hundred eighty thousand less than what our free cash was certified for FY twenty three. But that, am I correct that that includes what we voted on at the April town meeting? Or 
So, so like if you have, if you, if we, if there's something funky that goes on and if we vote things at the April town meeting to pay from free cash, yeah. doesn't that down adjust your number as a seven one? Or no, it, it, it'll adjust down your number that was certified for this year. Right. right. To get to your FY24 year. So is the 3.2 million before the town meeting votes or after the town meeting votes? Okay, that's where it gets funky. So in my opinion, our free cash as of 6.30 would exclude what we voted at town meeting. Because we haven't spent it yet. Right. Yeah, that's the way I think of it. Is it, it, it but whereas the, the way the state does it is they assume you've spent the stuff. The state pulls it up, it's allocated. Yeah. Once it's voted, it's allocated, it's out. Yeah. Even though it's still there. Flow wise, it's not. Right. Or fiscal year wise. It's not. Right. So that would yeah. add 1.6. Right. Okay. That's I mean, so essentially we're at 4.8 and then we're talking about adding in about another 470 estimated end of this fiscal year. Well, it just, <laughs> if I was to look at a bank statement for June, right? So we don't need to worry about the one six. We prove that it's just, just cash, cash, cash. It's going to be 4.8 plus the 470. Is that right? It's going to be about five, two. Five, or did you five, three, two, two include the four, seven? No, three, yeah, the three, two, seven. Yeah, so she's already yeah. included the four, okay. seven. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's 4.8. So the 4. bank 8. statement would show 4, 8 as a June 30. Oh. And that's stabilization plus both. Stabilization is at like 1.6 or 1.8. 1.8. Yeah. That's the two thirds vote to. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a special town. Okay. So that answer that question. And so the next item on the agenda is town reserves and what data do we need to look at to establish a new target? Because at our next meeting, I think it would make sense to discuss the reserve situation and what we feel we want to carry as reserves going forward, which will help them with the budget. And, and I just don't know, I'm not sure what type of data we should be looking at. I, I clearly have a concern because our stabilization is so high. And it seems like we need a certain amount of additional reserves that are not in the stabilization fund. So is, yeah. is, a, is a potential way to address that, to try to vote to have some of the funds from stabilization move to normal reserves? Could. Take 1.8 down to some slice of number? And, as long as they have a two thirds vote. And do towns do that? I mean, um, do we have any benchmark data on what people have for stabilization versus total reserves? That's what I'm looking for. What benchmark data yeah. do we want? So I, I as I mentioned before, I have the benchmark data. Now I didn't have it broken down stabilization versus what I think free cash, but um, I got a lot of data on balance. Mm -hmm. That's right. that is it combined or, what's that? Is combined stabilization plus? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a way to dive in. I'm getting it from Andrew, that same ELR. ELS, yeah. ELS, yeah. Right? yeah. Um, yeah I thought I pulled that, pulled that cells for you guys for like, like other communities have free cash. And Do you know when you said that to us? Bond authorization. Remember the bond ratings? Like yeah. Comparisons? yeah. Was that in May? Yeah, I'll find it and I'll forward it again. Thank you. Yeah. I, okay. Okay. I found 20 towns that are AAA rated that on average, about five percent total that stabilization plug. Yeah. You know, if most did most of them have regional school districts too. It was a, it was a mix. 
So some yes, some no. So like, I think Cohasset was one and they're not regional. Sudbury is regional, so it's a mix. I, I think it would also be helpful to have all the other money. Outside the fire engine fund, we've got um, enterprise funds, we have capital fund allocations yeah. that we haven't spent, all that kind of thing, just so we could look at the total picture. If that right, if that if that variance continues to grow, like the variance between actual cash in the bank versus like what we say we have because it's been allocated like that's, that's a problem right right well and that's what i would like to get to is to examine all the capital line items and how long that money has been held i was very surprised sitting in a town meeting um when it, they raised the issue about stormwater, um, damage for stormwater. And to hear Chuck say, well, I have enough money from prior years. And I'm kind of sitting there saying, oh, I didn't know that was money from prior years. And that's not the only thing. Right. Um, and I would like to set up, a, set up a policy of saying, you know, something has to occur and it has to move to trees of cash after a certain- Use it a little. Yeah. After a certain amount of time. Yeah, right. Oh, it's yeah, that's what the CPC does. They have a two year you know, okay. limit. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, we'll discuss it with them if you want us to do more time. Is there capital allocated to enterprise funds? That, and, and is that typically a couple of years or is that like a, is there like a 10 year piggy bank on some of that stuff? I'd say they, they spend it pretty pretty quickly. Um, so it'll be appropriate we spend, but there is like a carryover um, year to year. And what are we appropriating to the enterprise fund? Is it capital like, items? Right, it's like water pipe replacement okay. yes. and a sewer treatment plant. Um, a lot of times I don't know, water Chuck's water. still on. Um, you know, he has a plan like, you know, he knows that like next, like we appropriate about $200,000 a year, say for sewer treatment plant, but we know next year we have to go you know, replace a large thing, it's gonna cost like 350,000. We'll have to wait until the next year to do that. Um, just to keep that capital steady. Because as we, if we increase the water rates and have more revenue, then we should have more money to put towards pipes, right? right. Yes. If pipes supply oh, yeah. go ahead. Can you- yeah, I was just, I was just saying I was, I'm here if you have a specific question, but Andrea nailed it on that one in terms of the, capital and uh, water treatment plan, wastewater treatment plan, all that. So if there's any specific ones, I can speak to them. Well, I, I think we would like to meet with you sometime in the fall. Um, and maybe that would be some of the information you can give us is based on what's in the enterprise fund, what if you have expectations as to how it's going to be used or not. I have lots of expectations. I would, uh, yeah. Anytime you guys want to sit down, we will sit down. Hey Chuck, are you are you doing a capital summit sometime? It's it's on my list. Uh, every time I try and pin down a date, it seems like something else more important uh, pops up. So now it's a uh, new town meeting for June, and then uh, you know July is probably not the best time to do it. Plus Nate will be out, and so. Uh, Hopefully either August or uh, uh, early fall, because you, you know back? obviously we obviously yeah I'm I'm pretty much back, but obviously we have uh, our you know regular um, you know budget planning starting in the fall and I guess even earlier this year, but yeah. um, you know in general you know we have a lot of things. I think last time we talked, you know we have the facility plan wrapping up uh, in the next month or so. We have uh, hopefully a basis of design. Uh, report on the wastewater treatment plan as long as well as some other long-term things and then I think Steve probably mentioned in his uh, talk uh, earlier about you know accelerating some of the capital in the water pipe um, so if we do that then we're looking at additional work on roadways obviously and uh, the reason I couldn't make it at the beginning of this meeting was the select board 
wanted to discuss going to, you know, concrete sidewalks, which, you know, roughly double the cost for all of those work, that, those projects. So there's a lot of uh, competing interest for uh, money and capital. So uh, definitely worth having a summit, in my opinion. Okay. There was, oh, um, I, Chuck, I had a question on the um, ARBA funds for the new water loop. Uh, are we pursuing working actively on that out towards East Manchester? Is that something that's ongoing or is it on hold? Well, so we, we funded the design out of ARPA and that that is underway, you know, where uh, I'd have to look back and see where we are, but, you know, roughly 50%. Um, you know, if, if I thought that we had that money uh, available for construction in the short term, then, you know, I would push that to be done a lot quicker. Um, but it is under contract. It's just we haven't we haven't finalized the design yet. Okay. Okay, so we're good on the town reserves item. Yep. Okay. Major, if you want, I can send you that. Yeah. Well, like right. I, did, I just went through it quick, and it literally looks about half and half. So, like, Wenham's in there. Obviously, you know they're regional. Yep. Oxford and Topsfield, you know they're regional. Yep. Sudbury's regional. Sherborne. So it's about half and half. Yes. Uh, CPC new fin pump member. Did you have something else to say, Chuck? Your hands up. Nope, sorry, I'll put it down. Thanks. You confused me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's my under so so we have a member of the finance committee on the CPC, an actual member of the CPC. So it's my understanding that Andy has resigned and that Dean has been assigned. Have you been voted in? Sworn in uh, at, at a uh, CPC meeting? No, at, by the town clerk. Um, no, not for CPC, but I, I've been sworn in for town boards. Is there a, a different? You have to be so sworn in by everything you're on. Okay. Every okay. Day. Is it a different oath or is it the same oath? <laughs> so, geez, I was just over there. Did, did the select take a vote? Does anybody know? Okay, I'll check. Select board has to vote. Okay. I'll send something to Debbie. Well, I was planning to attend the meeting on the 29th. Good. And Good. Then we're going to look at what what we have left in unspent capital. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> I had just assumed I was already sworn in as a board member and that it was the same. Oh. I had to go to be sworn in for the MBTA zoning task force. I said, yeah. enough is enough. <laughs> they should look at moving the station this week. <laughs> uh, a liaison assignments. So I, I would like to work on the W and uh, Suggested to Greg earlier, I copied you, Sarah, uh, that we meet on a more periodic basis, just given all the all the potential work that's happening there, and just the way that everything kind of came together in our budget this year. Yeah, town's budget. yeah and and the, the other thing I'm thinking of is that we still have the liaisons, but I'm thinking that with DPW police and fire that perhaps have them meet with the whole FinCom before the budget season starts. I mean, we have a new fire chief, you know, we can figure out what his goals are, what type of equipment he wants. <laughs> before it's baked in, you already got what? the ladder. <laughs> before this budget submission is what I'm thinking. His department. Yeah, yeah, to just have a conversation with yeah. those groups and, um, you know, just to get a better feel. I think once we get into the budget season, things are a little more hectic. And I think the extent to which we can hammer stuff out in advance of the budget being submitted to us, the easier maybe it would be. Probably won't be, but I can have my dreams. So they shape the, the bigger philosophical picture. It's usually by the time we get the budget, it's tweaking little things, not <clears throat> achieving big things. Right. So early is better. Yeah. 
Okay. So Andy's going to be DPW. I'd like to continue with the school stuff. Maureen People wants are, the schools. Okay. I was going to offer the school if you want the break. I'd like to keep going with it. I think we're going to have a challenge here. Do I need to order so the CPC from the select board, or can I go get sworn in anytime? You can't be sworn in until then. Until then, I hear from you. But you can go to the meeting, nobody will figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, does anybody want to do fire or police? Would you like to do something, Brad? I was just going to say, so <laughs> as the new guy here, um, what does what the role entail? So we, Just, we I can take this off. You meet you <clears throat> meet with the chief, one of the chiefs, and just kind of they kind of present what they're planning on doing, and you just kind of give them some feedback and raise any items that might seem a little out of whack and, okay. and ask them to go back and look at things if it. I mean, last year I met with the police chief and we were talking about the staff. Okay. And so I had some suggestions for him, which he went back and looked at. So it's that sort of thing. I'll do fire. Okay. He's, he's new. He's still happy. <laughs> okay. So I, I just, I, I guess, similar request to what you were saying about DPW police and fire with school. So, I mean, end of the day, school represents half of the town budget, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the biggest. So, um, I'm losing my arm wrestling, you know, match here with Lori. Just, I don't know if there's a way. Um, it's almost like you want combined FinCom school committee meeting, like, you know, whatever, every week. I, 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 yeah, unrealistic. I think that Essex wants combined FinCom select board meetings with both towns to come to an agreement. So yeah, I, I think that I agree that, and I think that the, the school committee wants that. So, so I think that I agree that I think somehow there needs to be meetings with a school committee, which there haven't been. Yeah. We only meet with Pam and Avi. I mean, um, as, as much as we don't like getting the last second curveball on just grabbing stuff, you know, firefighter overtime, that punch in the gut is nowhere near the dollar impact right. of the school cool. stuff, right? Yeah. Like that's right. just math, right? Yep. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, whatever the best way is to just. Yeah, I, I, I think that I'm almost thinking we need to meet twice a month in the fall to hammer through some of this stuff before we actually get to the budget. I, I don't know what people think about that. I think that's a good idea. I mean, I think there are a couple things going on in the school. First of all, the school. There's a hierarchy of how things happen, which is you got Pam and Avi putting together the budget. You got a school committee that essentially votes on it per agreement, and then it gets distributed out to the two towns. The problem is the school committee is a very young and green group, and they would benefit immensely from sitting down and talking with people who have been through the mill beforehand. That's number one. Number two is I think we need more people who are smarter on financial stuff like Daniel Dan and others vetting the school committee budget before it gets thrown to the two towns. Because when the Essex FinCom starts sinking their teeth into it, and we do, mm -hmm. we know more about that budget, frankly, than I think the school committee does. Yes. And that's a problem. It, 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 needs to be, it needs to be wrangled at their level, and then we get it and work it. But so those, are, I think, are objectives coming from this fall that we really need to and, insist on happening. And, and, I think and, that's and I'm not sure the makeup of that committee can handle it. But so that's committee. one more but reason I think we need to be, yeah. right, I don't know what the word is, integrated, collaborative, like, but exactly. just like, like all like, all in it, right? And, and I was kind of surprised that the school committee, I don't know who it was on the school committee, made the statement that the problem was the town's problems, not theirs. And I vehemently, disagree with that. And I told that to Anna Mitchell. I said, this is not our problem. This is your problem. You have to figure out a way to adjust your budgets to come up with something that's acceptable to the towns. Um, I, I, I think in the same way that it's a simple fact to say that the biggest 
piece of the town's budget is the schools. Like that's just factual. Right. Mm -hmm. I would also argue it's factual that the most important thing that the school committee works on is their budget. Whether or not anyone wants to admit that, I just that right. Yep. And so I mean, obviously they vote on tons of different things, right? Personnel and financial, but 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 that's that's the thing. They that's, need to spend more time on the budget. Right. Like that's and smarter time in my opinion. But, but with, with you know the kind of the arc that we're <clears throat> that we've been going in is um, we're only ever going to be able to do what Essex chooses to afford because of how we appropriation. Don't happens. necessarily think that. I, mm -hmm. I I think that if there was some creativeness in the budget that was showing that they were saving money in ways that didn't impact the education of the students, that you might get more people in Essex supporting it. I don't, I, I don't I, know I, for sure, I, but it's possible. I, I, I agree with that, and it just as an add-on, I just, I don't think it's as simple as that. Like, again, you know me, I love talking about reserves, and I think like, you know, it's, it's quite frankly, <laughs> It'd be hard for me to argue for a prop to an F override if I look at a huge reserve balance because I'd be like, well, I'm like, right? So I just, there's, there's a lot of different aspects, a lot of different perspectives. Um, but I, I, just, I just mean in, in the fact that they're, you know, even if they're whatever, they're, they're three, three and a half percent that they tend to go up each year. Um, that, you know, the way that that's, you know, if, if that ends up being like a 6% adjustment to Essex, you know, wow. that's, that's a huge issue. And it's going to be it's going to be more next year by all accounts. So uh, you know, I, I think it's a big deal to kind of go back into the uh, the formula and, and make an adjustment there. But it 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 does seem like it's very reactive. And I I, I wonder, you know, I wonder what other districts do. I just think there's just some things at a very high level that need to make sense. And what I mean is, if you have declining enrollment, which that's that's fact, right? The enrollment has declined, whatever word you want to use, significantly materially. I think two hundred over the no, past. No, sixteen hundred to twelve hundred. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. And over so that therefore, to me, at a high level, you need less staff, personnel, teaching people, right? I mean, this is I'm just doing math, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, and then what people say is, well, it's hard because seniority and tenure and teacher, you know, and all this. And I'm like, okay. But where am I going high level? Well, when you have what just happened, where I forget if it was four or five, I can't remember which, but you had four or five retirements. It's like, well, then that's when hopefully you can kind of do the Rubik's Cube and yeah. the gerrymandering or whatever, you know, but like, like that's how it should work, right? Like if enrollment's down 25%, I mean. They're, they're, they're playing up the fact they're reducing positions and that's, that doesn't help you get the voters on board. So I think this it's, year, this year there was a heavy resistance to the presented budget. And there was a lot of people responding to that that I don't think thought through how they were responding. There's a lot of sort of what I call draconian language and, you know, mm. polarized. Mm. This is, you know, words like dismantling and stuff like that, which is at the end of the day, we're 18 million, Essex is 9 million, and we're talking about the differential sitting on top. So, you know, it's a big bus moving down the road. It's it's not a dismantling. So that needs to get under under control a little bit. I mean, I think the school needs to take a little bit better look at sort of what I call fixed and variable costs. They're throwing everything into the fixed cost category. And if you pull back and say, all right, we're going to look at a little more at variable costs, and if maybe we have more user fees for these various items across the board and that you know and you and i chat about this i mean you and i chat about it with ben botrick you could go user fees down to variable cost i mean trim it right down to fixed costs people would freak and have a lot more variable costs in there like you want to offer ap something and you have enough people sign up okay of variable costs to do it but yeah the, the finance side of the school committee needs to get better and I think that's starting to push from day one that you guys need to get your house in um, and not have the two towns building a budget for you. <laughs> right, that's dangerous. Exactly. I think. You know, one of the things I, I noticed uh, when I was, I was looking at uh, Essex's budget from last year, and it appeared that you know, it was 
looking at all the right numbers, that their portion of the district cost is 43% of their 43% of their town. They're paying 43% for electrical. I thought we were both 50, but no. fair. Yeah. As it's less because yeah. they haven't they haven't curtailed their town expenses like we have. I mean, since COVID, we've been really curtailing the town expenses. I just always figured, like on fire, obviously they're always going to be cheaper than us because they, they're volunteers. So right. I just figured out of the gate, I just figured they'd be leaner mm -hmm. on their town. Yeah. Uh, they spend on weird. Did they build a whole new public safety that building? That public safety building gave them a lot of money. That was an expensive well, they, they, but that's it's kind of it was a normal point. They turned you know, down the first one. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. They've been living off the normal point revenues, mm -hmm. and you're, you're going back. And maybe the restaurant revenue is down with the bridge construction. And if that's open now, maybe we'll have better receipts that way, too, because we should pay a local tax. Yeah, I, I, I took a deep dive into the data, it might have been a year or two ago, but you know, I took the three inputs, right? So it's town population, equalized value, students from each town, and then equalized, right? And what was funny is if you if you take equalization, just put it to the side for the moment. If you just do town population, it's 64, right? Or 60, yeah. therefore. And if you did students from each town, I, I swear, within point, it's almost 64. Right. So you like it you, would actually make sense if the split was 60 40, but then you you plop in the EQ, the, you know, and it goes from 60 40 to 37 63. So I guess where I'm going is anytime I hear someone from Essex saying, oh, we're paying to, and I'm like, no, it goes the other way. You're getting a little, if we, yeah. If we were to reopen the agreement, my position would be you get rid of the population because that has no bearing on the tax rate or on the schools. And, and you use the enrollments and the equalized assessments and do a 50-50 across the board. See, I and that would put more of a burden on Manchester, but- My, my vote, uh, if, if it was through, I would say take the, the equalization out and just go population and student. I don't think, I don't think, see the reason I'm, I would include the equalization, the values is because that's what the taxes are based on. So that makes sense to include in the formula, as does the enrollment. But think about it like this, just it's, this is very, very theoretical, right? But what if what if you wave the wand and the two towns were now one now? Let's just population say. wouldn't matter. But that neither would equalize value if these cost per student. Right. right. And, well, and, and is the, so where I'm going is, to do it, where I'm going is right. right now, we pay roughly, Manchester replaced roughly 22,000 for right. student we sent, they pay 19. I so if you, if, you, if, you, if you wave the wand, guess yeah. what? Yeah. Now we're all paying whatever the right. point is. Oh, I agree the real way. 20,500, right? Like, that, that's yeah. just the but student, but that's going to kill Essex. Yeah, but the, you know, it's funny. They, we both send lots of kids to Essex Tech. I think as a percentage of total town population, they send more. Yes. Which means they do. they're cutting a big check to Essex Tech. Yeah. And Essex Tech, as we know, they don't do EQV. They don't do it. They just go, this is the tuition. Here you go. It's 18 grand per student. That's all right. Yeah. 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 So, but I mean, when you start to open up the agreement, I think a lot of things start to open up onto the table. Correct. And I mean, from a marketing direction, maybe you start looking at rock. And you say maybe right. they should be included in this mix. And maybe you start taking a look at school choice. And school choice can be managed really effectively and it can become a disaster like it was in 2017, right. 18, right. 19, yeah, it was So I just think it's a be careful what you wish for. I don't want to yeah. open the thing. Yeah. That's all I'm, I'm, saying. I'm very nervous about it. I was thinking that uh, this the school could do some marketing <laughs> to try to encourage more of the Manchester students to uh, enroll in that. Right. So I think, you know, when the high school was built, Sarah was chairman of the building committee, they had a huge number of students come in in that time frame. That was like 2012, 13. Yeah. When Memorial happened, um, it, it was COVID. I think a lot of people said, I don't want my super young kids sitting in a construction site. And they got involved in the private school scenario. The economy was good, and they never came back. Right. And 
And maybe they sort of said, well, you know, the impact of being in town as a kindergartner is not the same as being in middle school. I don't know. But it, it's interesting that that jump hasn't happened. Right. What I thought it would happen. Yeah. But I think that was the COVID influence where so many people felt the public schools were so much slower to reintroduce the students to classrooms than the private mm -hmm. schools were. That's definitely a huge impact. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We digress. Yes. Um, next item on the agenda is we need to elect a FinCom chair and vice chair. Um, I'm willing to continue to be chair unless people prefer me not to be. <laughs> I move the term. All in favor. <laughs> Quick, while you <laughs> Take a vote. Take a vote. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, now we have vice chair. No, maybe Andy. Sorry. Are you willing to serve yeah, yeah. Andy? Yeah, I mean, I show the little below. I can show up. <laughs> Put all the glory. <laughs> exactly. Uh, take a vote. Yes. Mike. Yes. Maury. Yes. Tom. Yes. Sarah votes yes. Dean votes yes. Yeah. Um, next thing we have is two sets of minutes. Do people have a chance to look at that? I only noticed uh, I guess the first one uh, that was uh, Peter's, Peter's minutes is spelled somewhere in there. Okay. And I noticed in the on the April oh on the April thirteenth minutes. I noticed on page two, the first occurrence of Bellata said Mr. Bellata instead of Miss. Ms. That's about a third of the way down. And which set of minutes had Peter's name wrong? Uh, it's that first one. The 29th? Yeah, the 29th. But, uh, it was down in. Uh, Mm -hmm. Gail, can you look at that? Well, I'll see, I'll see tomorrow if I can find it. Yeah, it's um. Where's it? It's let's see, it's it's under the FY twenty four budget revisions and that on tax rate and time groups. It's it's on yep. the bottom of the sized second line. Oh winning. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay. Twenty. Did you get that, Gail? Okay. Just recording it. Yeah. I'll send you an email. Okay, do I have a motion to approve? The minutes from March 29th and April 13th. A second. Second. Maury seconds. Um, roll call vote. Yes. Mike. Maury. Yes. Tom. Yes. Dean. Yes. Andy. Yes. And Sarah votes yes. Okay. Next meeting, dates and topics. Um, one of the things we need to do is to be consistent on our dates. I had problems with this meeting because when I asked for a room, they said, sorry, you can't have one. <laughs> and I said, well, I scheduled this meet meeting a month ago, but was told I couldn't apply for a room in advance. So it <laughs> turned out that <laughs> Concom had this room, but they had virtual meetings. So I made them go check it. So um, I'm thinking that the best day of the week for us to meet is Wednesdays, because I don't think anybody else meets on Wednesdays. We used to meet on Wednesdays. Yeah. Does that work for people? OK. Yeah. So don't, do you have a CBA meeting like a third? Third Wednesday of the month. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering is if, if people are agreeable. What? 
second and fourth Wednesdays of the week? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so if we look at July, that would be the 12th. No, the 13th. That's now the 12th. 12th. And the 26th. August would be the 9th and the 23rd. September. September would be 13th and the 27th. <clears throat> so it is this would be the 12th. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Is this under the notion that we're that we're using those dates to start telling people about next yes. year's budget? Yes. Okay. So I think the question is, is okay, on October 12th. Oh, Jesus Christ. July. <laughs> July 12th. Well, we have we can discuss reserves, right? Yeah. What else would we like to cover? Would we like to so for reserves we would have all of the capital item stuff and go over that and see if we can come up with a policy mm -hmm. or a suggested policy of what else would we like to cover i think housing is a big one affordable housing if um i'm wondering if we should look at picking a bond out to do something exclusively for uh, affordable housing as opposed to letting some private developer subsidize his profit to do a 10 percent I think use. I think that's something that needs to be left to the affordable housing trust but then it's so it's kind of the whole thing is still well, um, the, the 40B, we had a pre-trial conference on January 19, at which point they said they would decide within two or three weeks whether to allow MECT to be an intervener. I followed up with town council the beginning of April. He says, oh, they haven't done that yet. It should be any day now. Um, it's now June. And I think what happened is, is they restructured they created a Department of Housing and restructured DHCD, and most of the members on the Housing Appeals Committee were on DHCD. And I've heard there's lots of new faces. So I think it's just caught up in state inaction due to reorganization. So nothing's going on okay. but, at this point. Yeah, I feel like oh. we need to make some good faith efforts to do something or else we're liable <clears throat> to get something imposed on us. It's just a general feeling. I mean, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in principle. I just don't know the right forum. Yeah, so, or okay. it's finance committee or. With that note, um, I represent the finance committee on the affordable housing trust. Is there somebody else who would like to represent the finance committee on the affordable housing trust? And try to push them a little more. The problem is there's nothing just out there. Meeting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so maybe put some of these ideas out. I, we we recently uh, in May, um, Linda Crosby's building at one to three school was sold, um, and we're having the buyer come into the affordable housing trust to see if we can have a discussion regarding whether any of those units could be kept as affordable and there's also room with the buyer maybe talking about buying building marks and rent market rate condos or something that might give leverage um but we we can't st start the 40 b's we, we need to have a decision on the facilities to see if the dpw lot would be freed up for housing yeah um I sent you around the RFQ, which the affordable housing has gone out with two RFPs with zero response. And so they're doing the RFQ with the hope that they can have some developer nonprofit 
who would enter into discussions with them to suggest things that could be done. But it's with the prices in Manchester, it's like super difficult. You know, and I don't know the, the sale of one to three school is hidden in nominee trusts. So you can't see what the price was. What what happened with the, the stuff behind the like seaside cycle? Like so that has never gotten on the SHI list because the nonprofit doing that hasn't submitted but Betsy Ware submitted it to the state, but some information is needed from the nonprofit organization that has I mean that just feels like Everybody kind of did everything from the right intentions, but like we're just fell by the way. Well, it's just like, is it is also it? the state is sort of looking at new construction as opposed to reorganized. So, no, I mean that qualified. So someone yeah. could just like fill out a form or something like that. Like I don't know what's outstanding. All I know is it was submitted, and what I've heard. Like North Shore. Yeah. That's there, Nikki. Or what, Nikki. What's his name? Nikki. He needs to get his. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, and nobody's pushing him enough. Mm. And it's almost like SEMA needs to push him. It's almost like yeah, needs to push him? SEMA, who pulled together the uh, funding for that from private citizens. Um, because that will protect us from 40 Bs for two years. Right, that just seems like a low hanging fruit, right? right. Like, and, 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 if, and I feel like there's a lot of people in town that put money in that are feeling right. a little burnt, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think disappointed how we dropped the ball with this, with this town government. Um, there's a huge plot of land that's owned by the state right on 128 by School Street. I think it was their original DPW site. But, um, by School Street? Yes. On um, Pine on Street. Pine. Pine. School Street on the, as you're heading just before the exit, as you're heading northbound on the right. No, oh, that's like the Cornerstone Church. No, 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 no. Uh, this is on 128. Actually, I'm on 128 before you get this. So, why don't you just fix on the yeah. to 128 or underneath? Yeah. Like, up but, on the hill? Yes, down below yeah. in, in that area before the wetlands. But, I mean, if we could float a bone and develop something in there. That's but that's not for the town to do. Well, That's why we have an affordable housing trust. Okay, so we work. Yes, and I and I think that they would be more than happy if people would come forward with suggestions and help them figure out how they could accomplish it. Like if it's state-owned land, what? Well, how would they? Well, the state wants yeah. us to put this housing in. So <laughs> That's well, why I really thought it would be a good way to. You know, on the spot. <laughs> um, and I think the housing trust is going to talk to Cornerstone Church to see what's going on there. How, how big is that lot, Dean? You know? um, it's a few acres. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Looking on the map, it looked like a good okay. It was like on yeah. the one side of Jack Hill. Okay. Slow. But yeah, I think that that. We need more people in town coming forward with right. ideas and on how to do it. We need more people. I mean, the trust have talked to Linda Crosby several years ago about trying to deed restrict some of the units and she wasn't interested. We've got the property up on Desmond Ave. Um, that would be right, that be deed restricted for affordable, but I'm not sure that landlord is, is interested. And right. I think problem is is how do we get to these people and um, I, I think we got to fix that SEMA thing though if it right. because yeah. otherwise it's everybody's going to be like yeah I, like, yeah we stepped up we did money we, uh, the other thing hanging is that you know if we allow the accessory dwellings it seems like that's a great way for people to not get displaced out of town if they can rent a portion, but it won't somehow it should be able to count towards affordable housing because of that. You know, the, the fact that it 
the purpose of affordable housing is to keep people from getting displaced out of town. To well, be affordable, it has to be deed restricted. That's the only way right. it can count. As as unfair as that may seem, yeah. um, it has to be deed restricted. And that was the reluctance that some of the owners had who were charging affordable rates. But they didn't want the deed restrictions because they were concerned it would adversely impact their market value. And look at what has happened to market values in Manchester in the last three or four years. You know, they were right it would have adversely impacted them. So is there any other item we want to discuss on July 12th? It won't be here on the 12th, but I'm sure there'll be a okay. Do we want to look at this harbor study where that's going? Uh, graph. I mean, we could ask, we could see if Chuck was available to come in to talk about the draft of the facility study. Would that be good? Okay. 26, the draft of the facility study, because I think it's almost done. Okay. So wouldn't that be by July 26th? That's a month. I'll ask him. Make sure the harbor priority is still on the rotunda. It seems. Well, and I think that. I think we need to put the cap, we want to do the capital budget in the fall before the final budget, before the operating budget. Yeah. Um, and I think that we need the facilities study to do that. And then we need information, we'll need information from DPW on all the pipe stuff. I mean, I'm very curious to, to hear what's going on with Pleasant Street because we approved, well, 1.6 million for that piping and be interested to know, okay, what are they gonna do? Are they just gonna wait, hold that money or are they gonna do other projects? Right, and that's the part of the stuff we wanna understand from the DPW is what's on the list. Unassigned capital. Because I looked at the the old priority list, and they're doing things down in the third or fourth priority, and haven't done stuff on the first and second priority. So obviously, priorities have changed. There was a shift because of the shortage and spike of the cost of pipe. I think that's why they were looking at relining. But Pleasant Street might have happened just because they want to repave it. No, no Pleasant Street. They are thinking of putting a second pipe in pipe the water from Lincoln Street well to, to Gravelly Pond for the PF, that was PFA the treatment. Part, right. Yeah. But I, I I think that water may not be pleasant. There's not an urgent need to realign that. It was just a matter. I mean, it could probably wait another 10 years if they wanted they to. They were waiting. They were. The street. They wanted the to repave it before the culvert. Right. And people saw that we got another grant for the culvert. Yeah. So does that mean like 4% of the total cost is covered? 100%? I think, I think we're pretty close because we allocated money before, yes. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but they used it for design. Engineering. And yeah. I, do we sell it some lot? Okay, and I think we got grants of $7 million. I'm not sure exactly. So 100%? 100%? I think we're pretty close. Are both grants federal? Or? One was state. Oh, federal. One was the brick was the big one. That's federal, right? The most recent one was well, federal. Um, okay, then both are federal. Both are federal. Yeah, yeah. I thought we had some state money too. We may have three grants for all I know. When, yes, I think we have some state other funding. It must be state because usually federal grants don't want you to match grants with other federal funds. Okay. So when, okay. when like Chuck's up, when are we roughly? Breaking ground in September of next year. Yeah, fall. So it's a year from this. Yeah. 
And given what happened in Essex, this is probably like what, 18 months or so at least. It's a lot of disruption. But he said there's going to make a temporary gas change. You need to, right? But right. think about cars, trucks, buses oh. coming down 127. <laughs> it's going to be a lemonade stance on Pleasant Street. We're going to do real well. You got to tax the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, you can't close that for 18 months. It, there's a way to put money uh, in the contract, liquidated damage, you know, give them a yeah. certain period. Yeah. It's a, a trade off for the cost. Right. But um, one thing is hard too because, like, well, I think bread and all the utilities goes around. Yeah. Like, I, I, think, that I think that when we talk with Chuck, this is something we can discuss. Yeah. Okay, okay. to understand well, what the like plan 26. is. Yeah. Um, just better understand what all the plans are. Anything else we need to discuss tonight? Well, the 712, I don't know, start having more transfers, but just one. Oh, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's And that's all we would have to do. For fiscal year 23, we don't have anything else. I'll open this is it. I'm thinking as long as I have transfers on the next agenda, nothing's going to happen, but if I don't have it on there, I'm going to need it. Right. <laughs> right. And you have like two days after the 12th, and then the window closes, right? Exactly. Okay. 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 Um, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move. Um, moves. Second. Andy seconds. Mike. Yes. Corey. Yes. Tom. Yes. Me. Yes. Andy. Yes. And Sarah Roach. Yes. And we've lost our minute tape. In case you were wondering. Oh, good. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Today's the 20th. Theoretically, this is the workshop. People are all there. Do you want me to sign these now or take them home and bring them in tomorrow? I guess we'll have to bring I won't stand on the other side. Yeah, I don't know. It's not my choice. So typically, there's a solution. Good night, everybody. Both towns. Teresa. Do you get to come in later when you have to stay at night? Um, <laughs> Never maybe a little balance with her. I was surprised that people can say treasurer's office was a lot. The what? The their reserves, they can't. Oh, I didn't realize they were looking for somebody. What happened? Unless there is, unless there are two uh, town meetings, annual town meetings. That's why there's nobody in that. Yeah. Is that the person who was pregnant? So, school committee yeah. can't just vote yeah. to access. Oh, the maternity, even that It actually has to be the two and it, and it begs the Where question. Not why wouldn't you just yeah. have the towns yeah. allocate yeah. where money is needed? That surprised me because I actually thought it went the other way. Meaning, sort of they yeah. actually, the school committee yeah. has more flexibility than we know for us. In other words, yeah. as we know, once we lock down a budget for yeah. the future yeah. fiscal year, yeah. right, if we um, need to dip like, like we did with the legal fees, fees right, we yeah. actually have to like call a special town meeting. It's right. kind of silly because like we're sitting on millions yeah. and we got to approve 100 grand, but like we had to do it, right? My understanding was. They even have they have way more flexibility. Yeah, and thought, um this Pam said this I, to use reserves. 
what I said. I had an opinion on it. I said, I don't think that's something that should be done across the board. I think it needs to be looked at the people and are they really, I mean, like who does the town administrator have in his office to? I mean, maybe maybe there is somebody in town, you know, but I think just just arbitrarily changing the title, I'm giving people more money doesn't solve the problem if they're not the appropriate person to really take over. I guess that's where I'm coming from. We'd have to have a vote. Yeah, we'd have to have a vote. And I was like, so that's what made my brain go, you guys actually have okay, yeah. more so flexibility over here than we have. Well, yeah. That's something to check into. I'll shoot it here. It, it just seems like to me like the town meeting ballot over oh, here to my idea. Why wouldn't they just go for the meeting ballot? Within reason. Who's this for the school committee? So I was just saying, I was chatting with Pam the other night. Yeah. When we met with Sokolo, I was there with the select, and they're going over the warrant. And I was saying, let's talk for a second about the access of the reserves for the school. And she was saying, well, it requires, you know, a town meeting and a vote and whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's right. They've been using them right. without getting permission from us. Right. They can use, all they, all we're voting on is the operating budget and they can move money around any way they want. Right. They have, mm -hmm. they have and, also, and, um, we did put stabilization, we did put into stabilization.